Hello, everyone. Welcome to another binary episode of the Day Zero podcast. I'm Spectre with me is Z. Today we have some DSI browser hacking, uh, EM side channeling to break AES, and some fuzzing talk. Before that, though, we'll cover the Spot the Vuln challenge of the week, which was a recycled challenge that some of you have been with us for a while might find familiar. Um, so, yeah, it's assembly. It's a bit of a change up from a lot of the higher level language uh, Spot the Vuln's we have. Um, and it's just like a simple syscall uh, that doesn't really do very much other than copy in some user data. Uh, the problem is that it takes uh, like user input, uh, UAP is uh, user argument and parameters, um, and it will use that for the copy in size. And it'll try to check it against like, uh, to see if it's like greater than 30 and try to jump around it. But the problem is, um, for those of you that are really familiar with x86, um, and to be honest, like, it's a little bit subtle because I have to look at the jump table sometimes to remember myself. Um, but JG is actually a signed compare instruction. Um, so there's a signedness issue. Uh, if you pass a really large size uh, that would overflow and, and that set the sign bit. Um, yeah, you could just uh, get a really large size passed in and bypass that check. So kind of a simple issue, but it is a little bit subtle where it's at the assembly level. Um, what the proper instruction would be there is that should be a JA instruction for jump above instead of jump greater. But yeah. Um, and some of you got that in chat pretty quickly. So yeah. Um, sorry for it being a recycled challenge, but it, it's been a little while since we've had this one up. So we figured, yeah, we, we throw it up. Yeah. This one wasn't even, um, uh, like I think we used it during your PS4 streams. I'm not sure if we ever used it before, like as a pre stream thing. Uh, we, we might, might not have, have yeah. but I know we used it during like your PS4 X like streams. Uh, that said, I do like this challenge largely because this is one of those issues that we'll talk about sometimes from the higher, uh, higher level perspective. I think we've seen some examples of this in C, but it's really hard to actually spot when you're dealing with C because you have to keep all of the like uh, integer promotion rules in mind. You have to keep how it's going to do the comparison in mind. Whereas in assembly, it becomes quite a bit more obvious like yeah you do need to remember j versus jg and it's not not exactly obvious until you know that difference but it's one of those things that is very clear in assembly compared to just seeing like uh you know greater than sign in uh or less than whatever uh in c yeah actually um Maybe on the disassembly view, it wouldn't be as obvious, but if you looked at this in like a decompilation view, um, it would probably be a good opportunity to catch this sort of bug, especially with like binges ILs. Um, because for those who haven't really used them, binges ILs actually have like the mnemonics to denote if it's like an unsigned or signed compare, uh, via like the U prefix on the uh compare operator. So it would it would stand out pretty well there, but in the disassembly, it, it can hide a bit easier, I guess. Yeah, so uh, let's get into our first topic, which is a fuzzing paper coming out of Georgia Institute of Technology on automated fuzzer composition at runtime. And if you don't exactly know what that buzzwordy title means, don't worry, I didn't either. Uh, but what this paper is about is basically letting automation in the form of this auto FC tool uh, take over your fuzzing campaign management, particularly when it, when it comes to like what fuzzer to run. Um, so instead of going through all the various fuzzers and evaluating them and trying to choose which ones to run yourself, um, Autofuzz will try all of them and monitor runtime progress to adjust and try to achieve the most optimal fuzzing setup. Um, and the core of that is what they call trends, um, although it's mostly like trend uh, in singular. Because basically they just check like uh, what kind of coverage is being hit, how many unique paths are being hit, uh, and yeah. they use that to adjust the resource allocation on a per fuzzer basis, um, mainly the CPU time being used. Yeah, the the key thing they're using there is that AFL bitmap, um, which is effectively a proxy to your actual coverage information. It's a bitmap of all the basic blocks and kind of give an idea of how many times they're hit, using that as kind of their determination factor. It's an interesting idea. Um, it does deviate a bit. Uh, I don't remember if we've talked about it before, but kind of collaborative fuzzing. They talk about bin the paper, or you could dive to some dive into some of the other papers they reference here when it comes to collaborative fuzzing. But it does go a little bit different from that. Um, if you're kind of curious, saying, well, running multiple fuzzers does sound a lot like that collaborative fuzzing. Collaborative fuzzing is where you go and run uh, 
effectively, you just choose a couple fuzzes that you think are going to pair well. So perhaps you do some pre-training, some uh, extra work up front to figure out what like the best two fuzzers that are like, um, just in terms of how they work or maybe complementary and how they're going after coverage, how they do mutations, whatever. Some aspects complementary. And so you run like multiple fuzzers. This is taking a bit more of a dynamic approach in that it is also updating how how much time every fuzzer gets scheduled for, uh, kind of on the fly, on the base of this very quick uh, time slice that they run initially. So initially, the first phase here, the prep phase, it's just seeing this quick run of all the fuzzers gets their uh, AFL bitmap to compare with that and use that to decide how much time they actually get. And so it will dynamically change over time if one fuzzer is now, like, now that you've got more coverage or more corpus or whatever, it's suddenly doing a lot better. Its mutations are working better. Now it's going to run that. It's an interesting aspect, and they had relatively promising results. Uh, jumping down onto uh, page, page uh, 8 here. They have this graph that kind of shows just the coverage. They only ran this uh, each campaign for uh, 24 hours. But in basically every case here, um, there's the thick green line is auto fuzz, and it was coming out on top. Um, so like, that is a promising result uh, to see that. I had a couple questions about their fuzzer selection. Um, because they compare here, they've got like uh, some that you'd expect, Red Queen, uh, Redamza, I think, yeah, Redamza's in here, Live Fuzzer, AFL. While they use like Red Queen, Redamza, uh, Redamza Mopt, I believe all those implementations came out of um, AFL++. They don't use AFL++ directly, which I thought was a little bit weird, especially because they are using the implementations from it. Um, but so that I mean, might be because AFL plus plus has some uh, additional dependencies, right? Because doesn't it rely on like Intel PT for doing like uh, coverage and stuff? It depends on the modes that you're else? running. Um, okay, because like AFL plus plus is kind of mashing together a ton of things. Uh, there, there definitely could be a reason. I just thought it was interesting that they would take out those implementations, but not just use it directly. Because they do cite AFL++ when they're talking, um, just find it here. Uh, when they're talking about, yeah, we also use implementation provided by, uh, footnote 17 is AFL++ for, oh, I'm sorry, LAF Intel, uh, not, uh, MOPT. Uh, I misspoke earlier. Uh, so they use it there. Anyway, I mean, that's kind of a minor thing. I noticed AFL++ wasn't there, and I would kind of expect it. Because I think their selection of one of the other things we've talked about with fuzzing before, fuzzing papers, is an odd choice of benchmark programs. And I actually quite like the programs they chose to use for the benchmarking on this one. Um, I'll pull back up that graph from earlier. You know, they chose things like FFmpeg, uh, Boring SSL... Uh, Lib Archive, I think, was in here. Like, they're not... I think I disagree with you a little bit on the target selection. I think it still falls in that same bucket as other papers where I'm, I'm not a big fan of the uh, benchmark target selection. Well, see, at least the ones I mentioned here, so TCP Dump, FFmpeg, Boring SSL, Lib Archive, uh, Image Info, these uh, PDF texts, these, they're all libraries that attacker information can definitely flow into and will actively be used in that sort of way. FFmpeg, for sure, SSL stuff again. Definitely TCP dump if you're just looking at traffic. That's another place where you're getting a lot of untrusted data can flow into these. So I feel like it's a fair choice. I mean, it's not the browsers. It's not where you see a lot of major fuzzing campaigns going. But I don't hate it. It's not like um, the one... I guess it's better than, like, GCC. <laughs> or the, TCC or something. The, the one paper I remember as covering, it was taking like uh, performance benchmark tools and like fuzzing those, like how quick it was like, um, you know, an RB tree implementation or something. And it was like fuzzing like a tool that was meant just to test CPUs for benchmarking, like not attacker at all. This has real data, it feels like going through it. Um, yeah. 
So, like, are there other choices that could have been made? Sure, but I don't see these as that bad of a choice. And uh, on the results themselves, uh, you kind of commented how Autofuzz um, basically topped, like, all the charts, which isn't too surprising, because essentially what they're doing here is they're taking... Um, they're trying to get the best of all worlds from the various fuzzers. Um, because another thing that they do that I think we kind of skipped over is that they do do seed synchronization between all the fuzzers. Um, that way each fuzzer kind of benefits and, and evolves from the progress of other fuzzers. So in like early stages where one fuzzer might be better than all the others, um, perhaps when it gets deeper coverage, some other fuzzer starts to take over and you can kind of like it, it'll continue to adjust over time. So that is pretty cool. Um, I, I think there is some cool stuff going on here. Um, and it kind of makes sense that, you know, when you combine them and take the best of multiple, that's why it's able to perform uh, as well as it does. Um, and yeah, like the target selection, some of it is a little bit like, you know, uh, falling into that category of like targets that are a little bit disappointing to see. But I don't think that really takes away from like w what they're doing here. And I think it is a cool idea. Um, but like you said, I mean. Overall, I guess their target selection is better than some of the other fuzzing papers we've seen. Um, so I, I won't hammer on that one. But yeah, yeah it's guess... a neat idea. Uh, and it seems that it has some merit. Uh, now, how well you can apply that into more cutting-edge targets, I don't know. Uh, I feel like it would be difficult because when you start getting into more complicated harnesses, I don't know how well that seed synchronization will hold up. Um, but, you know, it'd be worth giving a try at least. Yeah, and I guess on the... Uh... On the target choice, like some of them are maybe a bit more questionable. I can give you that. When it comes to some of the even larger things, um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I'd like to see this launch gain against like you know larger targets, something like a browser. Um, could be interesting to see, you know, how that turns out. Also, I yeah, I wouldn't be quick to make any assumptions that might not hold up there um and current so i'm not mentions... assuming that it won't for sure it's just a potential concern that i have i like i i see it as a potential failure yeah point, basically no current x like kind of mentions uh in chat usually you just pick the targets where your fuzz fuzzer shines like yeah i mean that's kind of a thing with a lot of academic papers you cherry pick your information a bit they have the benefit of you know maybe you know it's only 24 hour run here they could have run this on some other things and only chosen, you know, a reasonable set for themselves. Uh, there are ways it could be done there. We don't necessarily have evidence they've done that, so I'm not going to say, like, oh, they definitely just cherry-picked these. Seems like a reasonable mix, and if we're not thinking about just, let's apply this on the hardest targets out there or something, and you think about this more as, like, a fuzzing campaign for, like, as part of just AppSec, maturing security, somebody's running this in-house, this sort of approach, I think, makes a lot more sense. Um, although it does have the overhead needing to maintain multiple fuzzers. But that is a fair point, though. It might be like I could see it being used in like defensive, like a. Uh, I don't know if you could really integrate this wall in like a CI/CD type thing, but yeah, it could be used more on the defensive side for sure. Yeah, like I'm thinking like those more average targets, I guess. Like it does seem to take out some of the heavy lifting when you need to decide what fuzzer are we going to implement or going to use. You can toss multiple things at it. Uh, you know, you could reuse for several of these, you'd be able to reuse just the one harness binary uh, and pass it to several fuzzers. So like it could work in those cases. Yeah. Um, Brutamal mentions discount cluster fuzz. Uh, I guess in a sense, sort of, yeah. Uh, cluster fuzz does kind of do the same thing. Um, I don't know if cluster fuzz actually tries for. Like, I don't the think best they do like the same synchronization like and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't like, think they try to auto adjust the resource allocation. So it's not quite the same thing, but it is running like multiple fuzzers and whatever. But yeah, it's, it's, they're not doing quite the like in-depth uh, fine-grained tuning that this this research is trying to do. But yeah, I think it's a cool concept, and it would be interesting to see if it can apply to more of those like real-world targets for sure.
Uh, continuing on fuzzing, we have some uh, a Twitter thread on some fuzzing insights uh, by Alex Plaskett. And Z, I saw you talking a little bit about this uh, on our Twitter account, actually, so I'll let you get into it here. Yes, our very active and well-used Twitter account every so <laughs> yeah, often. <I> know. <laughs> what a fuzzful thing to tweet something that isn't just a stream announcement. And this was one of those cases. I saw Alex Plaskett put this out, and it's just like 10 insights or tips towards like some pra some practical thoughts on fuzzing um i won't run through all of them here but a few that i called out as being in my opinion kind of especially important is number seven the code assisted or code review assisted fuzzing taking the time not just tossing a fuzzer against your binary but taking the time to perform code review or disassembly review or whatever as it may be for your target of uh, to understand the areas that are a bit more complex where you may want to actually target your fuzzer and to figure out how to target your fuzzer towards certain areas. Um, I think code review is a really important part of a fuzzing campaign. And again, I say code review, but that could be the disassembly and reverse engineering too, if you don't have source, but actually looking at the binary and figuring things out there. Um, and the other point was on how you harness as being fairly important. You know, it's easy. We talked about... Um, was a curl the other week where it was fuzzing from a uh, CLI interface. I, I think it was curl that we I had believe it done was that. curl. Yeah. Yeah. I'm um, talking about kind of fuzzing there and where you're doing like those major entry points that are good fuzz targets because you hit that with the right inputs and it should be to reach most areas of the code, which make them really nice fuzz targets. But it also makes sense to be a little bit more specific to go in, um, and target either specific functions and do like more detailed fuzzing that maybe isn't getting as much coverage, but is getting deep coverage in very specific areas. Uh, it, it's just a good technique or a good thing to keep in mind when you're trying to run your campaign on getting that extra focus, not necessarily only doing end to end fuzzing from those really big or really popular entry points. Uh, but yeah, there's a bunch of kind of advice throughout here. Or, you know, again, insights kind of look for definitely a solid thread one stipulation i'll put in for the manual uh manual assisted fuzzing um sort of thing is like i i think it is a very good approach to have like that kind of hybrid approach um it can be super easy to get locked into like one side or the other though uh like it, it can be tricky to balance because when you're doing the tool dev um you can just easily get sucked into it, not want to do the manual review. And it, it's like easier said than done, I guess, is how I'd say it. Uh, it. It sounds ideal. It sounds really awesome. If you can try to do it, you should like strive to. But yeah, it, you got to have like a good bit of discipline, I guess, to uh, to be able to do it well. So it can be challenging, but I think that's just like when you think about the whole fuzz thing in the sense of. uh like a full campaign, you take on different tasks at different times during that. Part of it is going to be on development, part of it is going to be elsewhere. Um, you're right to point out, like, you know, need some discipline so you don't just fall into doing the thing you prefer to do. Uh, Which I won't I, lie, like, I'm I'm victim to that too. Like, I'm not above it. <laughs> I, I prefer development. I, I fall that way all the time for myself. Um, like, that's... I have a dev background, so... And I mean, you kind of make, you sit there, when you're building something, you have a metric by which you can actually see you're doing something, whereas just reading code, it's a lot of failure, it's a lot of not actually, or feeling like you're not really making much progress. Um, but still, when you're running the campaign, I, you see, I, I see it a lot with people that are just getting started with vulnerability research, they jump right into fuzzing because it's a potentially quick way to find bugs and their fuzzing is just toss the binary at the fuzzer and see what happens um do whatever this is just a reminder doing, too yeah it's just a reminder to dive deeper into it to be a human in the loop within your fuzzing loop you need to be there too um doing that code review you can start working on um on improving the coverage on improving the fuzzer like you can go on the dev side you can profile the fuzzer and stuff but um, more where I'm getting is looking at the code, using that to improve your whole fuzzing campaign. It's just you're part of the campaign too. It's not just the fuzzer doing the work for you. 
the way you can kind of sum it up is that any like hardened target nowadays, it's going to be basically impossible to find a an Ode doing the same fuzzing that everyone else is doing. Um, you have to have some kind of unique aspect to your fuzzer, whether it be tuning it down to a specific configuration or having your own definitions or something like that. Like there has to be something you're doing that's different um, that would, you know, make it stand out because you're not going to be able to match the compute power of people running like, like cluster fuzz, for example, you know, kind of circling back to that topic. Like you're not going to be able to match the computing power of like Google and like all these powerhouses. Um, so you can't really fight on that battleground. You have to have some kind of unique sauce and that's where having the human in the loop um, kind of helps solve that, that issue. Yeah, and actually, um, um, number six talks specifically about that, uh, compute resources. Software vendors having access to a lot more compute than, uh, you know, you as an individual may, so you kind of have to be smarter about uh, not just having your secret sauce or whatever, too, but just what attack service where you're actually looking at. Um, and kind of tying in, actually, to the last topic, different fuzzers find different bugs. Completely yeah. important point, like... AFL is big, or AFL and, like, the family and, and friends of it, because uh, there's a lot of variants there, uh, is a great starting place. It's absolutely solid fuzzer, but there are other options, there are other techniques, and being aware of those differences. So, actually, that does remind me, I don't remember the URL for it, but the fuzzing book. It's like this website, and it had a pretty easy-to-remember URL, fuzzingbook.org. Um, I'll, I'll give it a shout out here. One of the things I like about it, it's a little bit weird because they kind of use Python throughout for it, which just feels a bit weird. Um, uh, nonetheless, so it it talks about a lot of different types of fuzzing, and gives you a lot of information from uh how you might do coverage, different mutation ideas, or like concepts for that. Just a lot of information. That's a really nice reference to give a quick read over if you're getting into fuzzing, to kind of have the big picture of what are your options. If you look at, like, all the academic papers, things are moving quicker than the book does. But there's a lot of good information just within the book that gives you kind of the big picture about fuzzing. Yeah. Uh, Python makes sense for getting the idea across. You're not getting caught up in the code and implementation as much as the concepts it's trying to teach. Um, but It yeah, just like, feels I weird. Yeah, because I wouldn't want to write a fuzzer in Python. Uh, generally, you want your fuzzers to be fast. So, yeah. Um, and just uh, circling back a little bit, Rudimal mentioned that uh, Cluster Fuzz actually does do the corpus uh, sharing, apparently. So that's pretty interesting. I didn't know it did that. Um, that must have been... A, yeah, okay. So it was this issue was filed and, and closed in January of 2021. So um, yeah, I, guess, I guess it's been around for a little while. I just wasn't aware of it. Cool. So uh, moving away from some fuzzing stuff and getting into our uh, our vulnerability of the episode, <laughs> we don't really have that many, but we do have one. Uh, we have a post by Farlow on a bug and exploit in uh, Opera 9.50, which was used uh, to hack the Nintendo DSi. And it was inspired by research on the later 3DS uh, device, where a researcher named uh, Mr. Enbayo uh, previously used a WebKit layout unit test to try to find bugs in the 3DS browser, um, which is WebKit based. So they thought, you know, maybe we could use this on the DSi. Uh, so they did, uh, and they hit a fair amount of crashes. At first, none of them really looked too promising, though. Uh, basically, all of them were like null DRFs, um, which, you know, where the DSi is an older deviser, uh, device, there is data mapped near zero on the DSi, um, but it's not writable. So, you know, it's it's not really that interesting for a null DRF perspective for getting corruption. Um, but they started to think that maybe the reason they weren't catching other... Uh, types of corruption was simply an instrumentation issue and they just couldn't be detected. Uh, and the only scenarios they were able to cra like cause crashes were null DRFs. Um, so they went searching for an old uh, Opera 9.50 build, which they eventually found for Windows. Uh, and through Wine, they were able to pass some heap debug flags, which would poison freed memory with a tag value and run it again. And yeah, some of the bugs that they had that they thought were null DRFs were actually used after freeze um, that just eventually caused like a null DRF side effect, but weren't the root cause. Um, there's one bug in particular they focus on here. Uh, I'll bring the POC up on screen for those who can see it. Uh, basically, what's going on here is 
the POC would insert a media rule, a CSS media rule, um, then would try to insert another one with an invalid syntax and a try catch. Uh, and weirdly, the second rule, even though it's invalid and throws an exception, it still increments the CSS rule length. Uh, and then if you delete the two rules and try to access the CSS rules length, you would trigger UAF on the length uh, method access. It's not really clear what the root cause is, and they don't go into detail on it beyond stating that somehow the backing memory for the CSS rules is freed um, after that second delete call. I can only assume what's happening here is that while the CSS rules length is being updated on that second rule add, um, the reference count isn't. Uh, and so by adding this invalid rule and deleting both rules, it triggers the cleanup that involves destroying the CSS rules. Um, but because the length is one too large, that reference isn't cleared. I'm not sure. It's a little bit weird. Uh, when you get to these like browser pox, it, it can take a lot of work to try to figure out what the actual root cause is. Uh, and because he was focusing on a you know, earlier device with like no hardening, you just didn't really care about finding out the specifics of it. Um, just tried to get an exploit going. But that's what I suspect is happening there. Uh, I very well could be wrong, though. Um, but yeah, like I didn't have enough time to like try to dig into this and set up a debugging setup and whatever. It, it would take a while. But yeah, um, so we moved on to exploiting it uh, with their UAF function call primitive code exec is fairly easy. Um, since this is a DSI and there's not really any mitigations like DEP or anything, they just knob sled it. Uh, they spray with a canvas object uh, to use pixel data to get shell code and memory. Uh, and since there's no ASLR either, they can just get a reliable uh, alloc location after enough spraying uh, and then you know spray the predicted address of the shell code for uh, the length method overlap. So nothing too complicated, basically no mitigations in play, but that is to be expected where it's such an old device like a DSI. But still, even, you know, older game consoles, it's it's fun to see them get popped. So, uh, yeah, it's it's fun to see. It's, it's, fun place. it's honestly fun to see, you know, the knock sled in there. It has been a long time. Yeah, so, I mean, the DSI, I just pulled it up here is from or was released back in 2008. So yes, yeah, it's, it's been a good while. Um, yeah, it brought back some memories seeing the mention of the knob sled and heap spraying in that way where you're heap spraying to kind of have the large area. Um, oftentimes when we talk about heap spraying these days, it tends to be like a use app free where you're trying to give, uh, spray for the reuse uh, and less so about um, I mean, occasionally you'll have heap spraying in the sense of uh, grooming, but less so in this way, which is kind of just that old school heap spray. Uh, so I appreciate seeing that. Um, I did want to comment on one thing kind of earlier, the wine trick he used here, um, using the worn plus heap one. I wasn't aware of that, so I definitely want to keep that in mind. But I also want to mention, I believe you maybe do this on Windows binaries too. It's been a long time since I've actually had to confirm how this worked. But I believe when you run, uh, if you assume you're using like the normal allocator under Windows, uh, when you run that, uh, when you attach a debugger, I believe uh, after that point, um, it will automatically start using some canary values. I think there's like bad food was the one I remember running into, and I couldn't figure out why my exploit wasn't working because I had a debugger attached to it. Um, so I think there's somewhere you could have gone that route too. It has been a long time since I've looked into that, so it might not work exactly how I remember, but the way I remember it working was basically if you attach a debugger, uh, the heap would start using those canary values. So we do that, but that is a cool trick um, to keep in mind nonetheless. Uh, and possibly a little bit more useful than the Windows option. Um, I mean, you have the wine overhead, I suppose, but uh, you don't have to go through the whole debugger attachment, although that doesn't necessarily take a lot if you're not running breakpoints. Either way, things to keep in mind. I haven't seen that before, so that was new to me. Yeah, the main takeaway of the post, though, is just highlighting how useful that kind of instrumentation is um, when it comes to like triaging and stuff like that. Oh, yeah, I mean, there's that's kind of the case of like use after free is really hard to detect without instrumentation with. Well, I mean, this isn't necessarily instrumentation here because this is, um, you know, it's just the heat being filled with the garbage values to make it more likely it's going to crash rather than. Like a sandwich actually instruments the axes and can tell what's going on. That's true. Um, so um, not quite instrumentation, but like that idea, having something there makes it so much more viable to catch these bugs because like a use after free 
doesn't crash unless it kind of has specific conditions that lead to the crash. Yeah, you have to have a side effect that produces yeah, a crash, yeah. basically. So, yeah. Um, we'll get into our shoutouts with, with that out of the way. Uh, first shoutout is a post by Realize on breaking hardware AES with uh, EM analysis on the ESP32. Um, this is a pretty cool post. It's basically talking about recovering uh, an AES key by yeah using electromagnetic analysis um they use like the riskier tooling to probe the chip uh, try to find where the like aes or a hardware acceleration is actually happening um and they use like they side channel the key basically um i did want to do like a more thorough coverage on it but a, a good amount of it is like fairly complicated uh and this is using like a really expensive hardware too so it's not something that you can really take away very much, but still, I think it is an interesting blog post. Uh, it's fun to cover like the, you know, side channel, uh, style issues. They are harder to, to defend against. Um, and you can, you can kind of go through and see some of the magic that's happening, uh, on the EM side of things. It's a very interesting method of both fault injection and side channeling because it's pretty non-invasive. It's not like power, uh, power analysis or power glitching where you have to like cut into the power traces, which they actually call out in this post. Um, with EM, you're just, you know, analyzing it from the package of the chip, basically. So it's pretty cool. Um, there's a lot of, you know, sorcery going on, though. So it might be a bit difficult to follow. But still, I did want to give it a shout out for people who are interested in that stuff. Um, but it's kind of out of scope of what we typically cover. Um, yeah, it's definitely lower level con like stuff than what I what I would usually look at here. I just, you know, saw the pretty colors and the graphs. Yeah. Uh, it's more like a electrical engineering style stuff um, compared to, you know, well, yeah, it's pretty much all hardware. There's no software aspect to it. So yeah, um, it is a cool realm and it's, it's often like treated as a black box. So it's fun to see posts about it, even if I don't fully understand all of it. Um, so yeah, check it out if you're interested in that stuff. Uh, other than that, I think that's all the shoutouts we have, unless you have one Z, and we'll wrap it up. Yeah, I had uh, one shout-out, um, and that's this uh, finding 10x performance improvements in C++ with CodeQL. Of course, it's CodeQL, so I had to take a look at it. Uh, it's not a security post. This one is a little bit different. It's actually using CodeQL for like performance optimization, looking for matching code patterns that would produce inefficient... Uh, where compilers would produce inefficient machine code um, and looking for that so that you can fix and get better performance in your code. Um, but it talks about an interesting use case of CodeQL. Again, CodeQL, you know, we talk about a lot in the context of matching security specific things, but you can look for other sorts of issues too. And this is kind of a look at using CodeQL in that way. So I thought it was kind of interesting and worth checking out. At least if you have kind of the interest in code QL as I do. All right, cool. So that's all the topics we have this week. Thanks everyone who tuned in. I'm sorry it was a little late on the vulnerabilities, but yeah, it was just a bit of a slow week in that respect. Um, but yeah, if you want to catch past episodes, uh, you can find recent ones on Twitch and all of them on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and more. Uh, if you want to join our Discord and follow us on Twitter, as always, links for those are down below or in the chat. And with that said, we'll see you next week.